Good morning, my name is Avraham Amit and I'm going to say a few things about my memory of November 29th, 1947. Uh, a few things I remember very specifically and a few other things are a little bit, in a, in a, a, I'm vague about them. Well, uh, I was a member of the underground Irgun movement and a few days before the 29th uh, we were out on exercises I wouldn't call it maneuver, but basically there were maneuvers uh, in the mountains, Mount Carmel, my hometown is Haifa. Uh, I returned to my home on the morning of the 29th and I went to sleep. I was dead tired, I remember that. And as the evening came, you know, there's a seven hour difference between the time in New York and time in what was in Palestine. Uh, people turned the radios on and you could hear it just with the open windows. Uh, people were assembling in the streets and when the announcement came that the partition had been voted on and, and approved, people started yelling and shouting and dancing in the streets and so on. Some of my friends knocked on my door and came in and said, come join us, which I did not for two reasons. First, I'm not one for big crowds, but more importantly, I told them, let me sleep because tomorrow they'll be fighting, so I need my sleep. So I, I slept, I did not go to the street and celebrate. And indeed the following day, the fighting started. This was fighting between, the, uh, between us, the Jewish settlement, and the Arabs, the Palestinians. Uh, the other armies had not joined in yet. So the, the evening of the 29th, uh, I spent <laughs> trying to stay asleep and to be fresh for the following morning. And indeed, the following morning the fighting started. Um, my unit actually was in uh, the border of Jaffa, so I joined another unit for a while in Haifa and then I took a bus to Jaffa and uh, there was fighting there on the border between uh, Jaffa and Tel Aviv. Um, my memory of what happened after that is vague as to what happened when, but one story which I remember very clearly uh, I took a bus from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem because I also had to be involved in the fighting in Jerusalem. And the bus was uh, what we call in Hebrew uh, autobus mishurian, which is an armored bus. In other words, armored in the sense that there were pla plates of glass, uh, not glass, uh, metal to add additional protection. And one of the funny memories of that time I have is there were a few of us on the bus with uh, basically arms, submachine guns, and we, were, we saw that we were going to stop by the British patrol. So uh, we, there were quite a few uh, Sephardic women on the bus, and they were wearing long gowns, which was a custom, not, not skirts or pants. And we asked them if they would mind hiding the few uh, submachine guns we had in the bus under their, un under their big uh, gown. And they were very hesitant, but we assured them there's no danger. And the English, they came on the bus, and whether they suspected that the women hiding arms or not, I would never know, but, but the English were considering all other colonial powers were, were quite civilized. And they, they left us alone, so we continued to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was actually under siege. And there were convoys from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem uh, to bring people food and so on and so forth. Uh, I was involved for a while in a fighting at Ramat Rachel, which was outside of, Jer uh, outside of Jerusalem. Well, uh, then the fighting went on and on and eventually uh, the state was declared and then the official war started. By official I mean that the neighboring Arab countries sent their troops to Israel. Um, how old I was? On November 29th, I was I think just a couple of months shy of being 19 and as I look back at the situation now, it was really pretty hairy, but the thought that we would not win had never occurred to me. I don't think it occurred to anybody <laughs> at that age. It certainly must have occurred to people <laughs> who are more mature and had greater wisdom. 
Um, well, and after that, it, it's, it's a history, the fighting and the war and everything else. My military service, as far as the state is concerned, they, count, they counted the time I spent in the Irgun, fighting in the Irgun, and the difference between the Irgun, which split from Haganah, was the Haganah's philosophy was, we, we, in he, the Hebrew word was Havlaga, which means restraint. You defend yourself, but that's it. The Irgun says, no, you don't defend yourself just by sitting and waiting. You defend yourself by going and attacking them. You know, the Talmudic thing, Haba lehargecha hashkim vehargo. So that was, that was the main immediate reason for the Irgun splitting for Agana. How did I get involved with Irgun? I went to a, to a private school, and I would say almost everybody in that, my class joined the underground. It was, it was a very active school. Uh, two of us, I'm one of them, joined the Irgun. Everybody else was in the Haganah. The reason I joined the Irgun is I agreed with the philosophy. My family, my father was a revisionist following Jabotinsky. So it was a natural for me to prefer the Irgun over the Haganah. Well, Jabotinsky was a, he founded what was called the revisionist Zionist movement. There were, the Zionist movement was at that time, we're talking about the, the, let's see, right after the First World War, 1915 and on, 1920, there was the so-called practical Zionism. In Hebrew, it was called Tzionut Ma'asit, where the promoters of that were Chaim Weizmann, Ben-Gurion, and so on. The main thrust there was to settle the land and to establish a Jewish settlement community in the, in the, in the country. Uh, then there was the political Zionism, where Jabotinsky was the main proponent of it. There were others, of course, involved. And the, the political Zionism emphasized the political goals, uh, eventually working toward a Jewish state. And, and that was the main philosophical difference. Eventually, the, the, they joined together. Uh, I should say, for the complete, to complete the history, uh, during the Second World War, the Irgun ceased all actions against the British. The idea was the Germans are much more serious enemy of the Jewish people. So the Irgun had no actions against the British. And actually, the head of the Irgun took a group to what was now Iraq to support the British against the Iraqi government, which joined the Nazis. And he was killed there. And Dayan, who everybody knows had a patch over his eye, he led a group into Syria, where the French in Syria joined the Vichy government, and he went there in support of the British. So Dayan was wounded in Syria, supporting the British, and Raziel, who was the head of Irgun, was actually killed. I remember the name of the place, Habania. There was a large military airport there, and he was killed in Iraq, again, supporting the British. Uh, then th there was a third split. You know, Jew Jews <laughs> split a lot. You see that in Israel, every now and then somebody decides there are too many parties, so they form a new party, and they call it the Unity Party. So now you have one more party. Uh, the, what was became known as Stern Gang, uh, Stern split from Irgun. So the Irgun had split from Haganah, and the Stern group split from Irgun during the Second World War on the ground that uh, it's okay to act against the British, even though the British fought in Germany. So that, that was the difference between those two. The Irgun, the official statement of the Irgun was we are only interested in establishing a Jewish state. And once a Jewish state is established, we dissolve because we have no political agenda. I must have been one of the few people who believed it. <laughs> and I had not stayed with Irgun and their sequel. They became the Harut party, which now became the Likud party. And uh, I am not of that branch of support of Israel. At the beginning, when the Irgun started acting against the British and would say bomb a police station and so on, uh, they got warning. 
In other words, the, the, the bombs were put there and then a phone call came in, uh, the, the building is bombed, leave it to avoid casualties. The most famous of these was King David Hotel. Uh, the bombs were put in, in milk cans, large milk cans, and they were brought into the service entrance. And subsequently, uh, after that was placed there, the British were not aware of it, uh, the King David Hotel was the headquarters of British forces. A phone call came to King David Hotel, the building is bombed, evacuated. The main functionary of the mandate at that time, well, there was a high commissioner, but there was a, I forget his secretary or something, somebody named Shaw. And he got the phone call himself or somebody in his office, and he basically said, I'm not going to take orders from these people, and he ignored it. So the casualties which were associated with that bombing were really because he refused to uh, take, I mean, he said, I'm not taking orders for these, for these people, but they had been warned. <laughs>